Few aircraft can stir emotions and inspire or quite like the Cold War greats, and chief amongst them is the English Electric Lightning. A marvel born of British ingenuity, it was an astonishing machine for its time, capable of producing beats of speed, acceleration and climb so insane that modern fighter jets struggle to match it. It really was lightning by name and lightning by nature. But this raises a question, if the lightning was so good, why is it now naught but a curious relic of a bygone age littering air museums up and down the green and pleasant land of the UK? Well, that question and more we bring to you today as we bring you the concise history of this magnificent warbird. So let's waste no time and let's jump in. The Cold War era, a volatile epoch where a nuclear-tipped sword of Damocles hung over mankind, set the stage for an intense technological race. One in which the world's capitalist and communist superpowers vied for any and every technological edge that they could get that might bring military victory over their opponents. Amidst this tense tableau, no aspect of military technology garnered more significance than the development of advanced aircraft, the very instruments that could rain nuclear devastation upon the enemy while shielding one's homeland from similar disaster. Just before we continue with today's video, I do want to tell you about something that will change your life as it has changed my life and that is today's sponsor, Sheath Underwear. Sheath makes the most comfortable boxer briefs that you've ever worn. If you're tired of boxers that are too loose or briefs that are too tight, Sheath is your absolute savior. I'm wearing Sheath right now. I didn't just take this pair off. These are, in fact, unworn, not just clean. <laughs> Not sure you my clean worn sheath would be a bit weird. Look, since being sponsored by sheath, my underwear drawer is just full of sheath. Everything else has been thrown away because there is no other underwear that you will ever need. Why they're so amazing? Well, they use stretchy fabric, moisture wicking technology. It's like personal climate control for your nether regions. It's cool. It's comfy. Everything stays right where it should be thanks to their innovative pouch system for all of your different manly parts. But look, if you don't like that, if you're not into that, whatever, just wear them as normal underwear. It's still much more comfortable than other underwear that exist. Plus, they've got mesh and bamboo. I haven't actually got the bamboo ones yet, but I have the mesh ones, which are amazing in summer. Like, I go to the gym a couple of times a week, and I always wear the mesh ones because they're, like, cooler and uh, even more comfortable somehow than the regular sheath underwear. So here's the deal. Go to sheathunderwear.com, treat yourself to the most comfortable underwear that you will ever wear. And because you're watching this video, use the promo code MEGA at checkout and then knock 20% off your order, which is nice. Again, sheathunderwear.com, promo code MEGA for 20% off your order. And now back to today's video. This ceaseless endeavor of aerial supremacy bore witness to remarkable innovations that spurred the evolution of aviation at an unprecedented pace. The formidable aircraft conceived during this period were not just instruments of war, they were pivotal chess pieces in the grand strategy of Cold War dynamics. It was amidst this exigent fervor to progress that the drawing boards of the English Electric Company birthed a marvel of British aeronautical engineering. The Lightning. It was an aircraft with a single purpose, to intercept and neutralize potential airborne aggressors before they could reach their targets. As such, the Lightning was fast, really bloody fast. Its top speed clocked in at an incredible 1500 miles per hour. That's roughly twice the speed of sound. This, for reference, allowed it to fly from London to Edinburgh in less than a quarter of an hour. But it wasn't just fast at the top of the dial either. It was also an aircraft with exceptional acceleration, having a rate of climb of 20,000 feet per minute, the equivalent of climbing Mount Everest in 90 seconds. This power came courtesy of the Rolls-Royce Avon jet engine. This may sound strange to those of you in the know because the Avon also powered aircraft such as the Hawker Hunter and Supermarine Swift, both aircraft that struggle to even break as a sound barrier. So what made the Lightning's engines quite so different? For starters, it had two of them and had them arranged on top of each other rather than side by side, which offered some slight aerodynamic advantages. But really, the difference was in a little something the Lightning's Avons had that those inside the Hunter and the Swift didn't afterburners. These clever devices operate on a simple yet effective principle, injecting additional fuel into the jet's exhaust. This fuel then combusts with the excess oxygen left over from the initial combustion and results in a substantial increase in thrust, akin to a sprinter taking a deep breath before the final burst of speed. And look, speed 
was all well and good, but what about its weapons? Firstly, it boasted two 30mm Aiden cannons nestled within its belly. Known for their devastating firepower and reliability, these cannons could tear through enemy aircraft with ruthless efficiency. The piece de resistance, however, was its missiles, with this initially being equipped with Fire Streak and later Red Top air to air missiles. These British made missiles were meticulously designed for lethal precision, employing advanced infrared homing guidance systems to find and destroy enemy aircraft by following the heat put out by their engines. But of these missiles, it was the Red Top that truly stood out, boasting guidance and explosive capabilities far beyond that of the Fire Streak. These missiles were the Lightning's main tool for combat, because despite the impressive power of the Aiden cannons, uh, they were significantly shorter range than missiles, and thus only really served as a backup weapon. After all, why engage in risky dogfights when you can dispatch your threats from afar? So now that we know what made the Lightning such a phenomenal aircraft, let's take a look at how it performed by looking at its service history. The first Lightning's reported for duty at RAF Coulters Hall in Norfolk, England on the 23rd of December 1959. Their job initially was a simple one, to familiarize RAF pilots with the full rigors of supersonic flight before the jet was properly rolled out across the RAF. Now, When you consider that many pilots at that point in the war were Second World War veterans who had started their careers on hurricanes and spitfires that maxed out at a third of the Lightning's speed, such a slow and steady rollout did make perfect sense. Even Britain's earlier jets would have struggled to truly prepare pilots for the Lightning's insane performance since they topped out at only half of the lightning speed and even then, only if they were lucky. The rollout, however, went well, and by May 1960 enough pilots had been familiarized with the lightning that it could be formally accepted into service. To say it was well received would be a little bit of an understatement. Its weapons worked great, and its pilots loved how surprisingly easy it was to fly even with its mind-bending performance. But it wasn't without its teething issues, and its extensive maintenance regime coupled with RAF mechanics' unfamiliarity with the type meant that most squadrons struggled to get more than 20 flight hours per month out of their Lightnings. This improved quickly, however, as ground teams quickly learned their way around the aircraft, and by the end of 1960, most Lightnings were happily delivering 100 flight hours per month. And those 100 hours per month was certainly not short of drama. Imagine that you're a lightning pilot. You're sat in a plush, padded wingback chair in your mess, enjoying a leisurely coffee and a browse of the daily paper, when all of a sudden, the call comes. A Soviet aircraft is approaching British airspace and it needs intercepting. You leap out of the comfort of your chair and within five minutes you're higher than Mount Everest and traveling at twice the speed of sound, all while wondering if this was the time that it was going to get real, whether the Soviets were actually going to have a go at dropping the bomb on your country. This sort of thing was the Lightning's bread and butter, a feat of performance that would have been the reserve of science fiction only years earlier, and now it was nothing but a daily chore. Nestled among the endless interceptions, however, are a few interesting stories that shed extra light on the reality of the Lightning service. One particularly interesting incident comes from West Germany in 1972, when the aircraft would gain its first kill, but not in the way you might imagine. For you see, it wasn't a Soviet bomber, nor even a Soviet fighter, that would earn the Lightning its first kill mark, but a British Hawker Siddeley Harrier. The aircraft had been on routine patrol when it had struck a bird, killing its engines. With no runway and gliding distance, the pilot followed procedure and bailed out, but it overlooked one small detail. It was pointing towards East Germany. Now, this was bad for a couple of reasons. It might hit someone on the ground and spark a diplomatic incident, or more scarily still, it might end up being recovered, presenting the communists with a treasure trove of Western military secrets. Oh no! Naturally, this was unacceptable, so it fell to a lightning to intercept, which thanks to overloading its engines to the point of borderline melting, it managed to do just before the Harrier drifted over the border, blowing it up in the nick of time. Another interesting incident occurred during Operation Sky Shield 3, a 1962 multinational exercise aimed at testing NATO air defense networks against a simulated Soviet attack. One of the many people taking part in this exercise was an American pilot who was flying a Lockheed U-2 spy plane designed to fly so high to be all but untouchable by enemy air defense networks works and interceptors. This appears to have made YouTube pilots, or at least this YouTube pilot, somewhat complacent, because when he got a hit on his radar that something was approaching him very quickly to his rear, he paid it little heed and continued onwards. He was most surprised a few minutes later when he turned to his left, and there, right next to him, at the edge of space, was a lightning, whose one pilot seemed particularly pleased with himself on account of the gesture that he was making with his middle finger. <laughs> Another interesting interception came in 1984, when a British Air Tours L-1011 TriStar carrying over 200 passengers lost radio contact and veered off course over West Germany and started zigzagging in the general direction of East Germany. A lightning was immediately scrambled to investigate the situation, and soon enough it pulled alongside the stricken airliner. All attempts to re-establish radio contact failed, but after having confirmed that all was otherwise well on board with the tried and tested, 
thumbs up method, the lightning then guided it back down to the ground manually through the use of hand signals and aerobatic maneuvers to show the way, averting what could have been a potential disaster. The lightning also had some limited success on the export market, finding its way to Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. Triggered by the North Yemen civil war and resultant air incursions into Saudi airspace by Egyptian forces, Saudi Arabia sought to improve its air defenses and thus ordered 40 lightnings in December 1965, where they subsequently successfully curtailed Egyptian Air Force intrusions. Conversely, Kuwait procured 14 lightnings in December 1967 and had very poor results. The Kuwaiti government simply had neither the money nor the know-how to successfully operate the aircraft, and after years of all but no operation, they were pulled from service in 1977, where they subsequently sat languishing in a hangar at Kuwait International Airport before being destroyed in the Iraqi invasion of 1990. Now, despite its interesting career, all good things must come to an end, and by the mid-1970s, this once revolutionary aircraft was starting to look a bit antiquated, and so Thorpe began to give it a replacement. Its speed was still phenomenal, make no mistake, and in fact the Lightning remains the fastest aircraft ever fielded by the RAF to this day. But the rest of it was rapidly showing its age, with more modern jets having better radar, better weapon systems, and better ranges. They were gradually phased out between 1974 and 88, being replaced by the F-4 Phantom. So, we've already learned some interesting stuff about the Lightning. But if we really want to get a feel for it, there is only one place to turn to. The people who flew it. So now, let's take the time to look at some stories from the men who flew this mighty machine. A particularly interesting perspective comes from Brian Carroll, who flew both the Lightning in British service and the much newer F-15 in Australian service. In particular, he draws attention to what we discussed earlier regarding the Lightning outperforming its successors in the speed department, stating the following. The overall impression was that both aircraft had very similar performance and handling characteristics. Both were a joy to fly. Considering the age difference, the Lightning's performance was totally outstanding, and when it finally bowed out of service, it could still outclimb most of its successors. Its initial rate of climb was 50,000 feet per minute, while the F-16's rate was 40,000 feet per minute, and the Tornado's rate was 43,000 feet per minute. So the Lightning reigned supreme. And do note that there are some discrepancies in what Carroll states the performance of the Lightning was compared to what other sources claim, with his estimation seeming slightly optimistic. But that is neither here nor there. His claiming an equivalency in performance between the Lightning and its successors, and his overall positive impression of the aircraft, is what we're interested in here. Another quote, this time from veteran pilot Ian Black, offers a slightly more mooted perspective of the Lightning. It allows us to garner more insight about exactly what made it so antiquated by the 1980s. He said the following, In 1960, it was probably state of the art, but by 1988, it was positively prehistoric. It was hopeless at low level over land and difficult at low level over the sea. At height, the targets would often be doing in excess of 0.9 max, so the combined speed of a fighter and target would be around 20 miles a minute, with a maximum pickup range on an average target of 18 to 20 miles. This gave you less than a minute from initial contact to engagement. It also had a very limited electronic countermeasure capability. Interestingly, this nicely complements Carroll's opinion, as Black doesn't claim it didn't have fantastic straight-line performance. He just explains why, by the 1980s, that uh, just wasn't enough anymore. He went on further to say something similar regarding the Lightning's weapons. Again, the weapon system was state-of-the-art in the 1960s, but by 1988 it was prehistoric. The system had potential, a data link where the ground controllers would perform the intercept with the pilot flying to the target hands-off. The weapons were fine against lumbering Soviet bombers up at altitude, but not great in a high-G combat scenario against other fighters. He then went on further still to discuss issues the Lightning had always had, even when it was otherwise a top-of-the-line aircraft. To quote, Lack of fuel was the obvious one. From a handling point of view, it was glorious overpowered, something few aircraft have. With its highly swept wing and lack of maneuver slash combat flaps or slats, the aircraft was flown in the light heavy buffet position, which masked any seat of the pants feeling of an impending stall. It actually had a few vices, but could be a handful on landing with its big fin and drag chute, which made the aircraft akin to a weathercock on a strong crosswind landing. Tires were also very thin by necessity to fit into the wings, so it didn't last long." End quote. Interestingly, Black's perspective is uniquely negative among Lightning pilots, most of whom have the kind of glowing praise that we saw from Carroll. There is certainly negativity to be found, but 
barely to that degree. For example, veteran pilot Roger Colebrook loved his Lightning specifically, but expressed doubts in the capabilities of the overall Lightning Force to respond to the Soviet threat if war broke out. To quote him, There were, unfortunately, flaws within our mega strategy. For one thing, the Soviet hordes, when they arrived, were likely to outnumber us by a ratio of approximately 30 to 1. Other than the implausible scenario that the Soviets would play ball, do the decent thing, be thoroughly British and orbit patiently while we rearmed and refueled, we faced something of a David and Goliath struggle. I sometimes speculated on the reaction of Dowding, leader of Fighter Command, in the Battle of Britain to our plan. Perhaps he would have said nothing. Perhaps his cold, hard stare, accompanied by the lifting of one eyebrow, would have sufficed. Other veterans are less extreme either way, and simply offer a grounded and reasonable explanation of what it was like to fly the Lightning on its routine interception missions, with one such example being the following quote from Jerry Parr. Before long, the distinctive outline of two tu 95s started to come into view. These Soviet machines appeared formidable and menacing. The crew appeared to be equipped with dark leather World War I type flying helmets, as if borrowed from the Red Baron himself. Sometimes the pilots would slow down suddenly or swerve dangerously in attempts to throw off interceptors. I drove alongside one of the bears. He seemed, though, fairly docile, and I was unaware of any particular reaction. I speculated whether these two aircraft were Cuba-bound. By now, however, as ever in a lightning, time began to press. I noted the tail numbers of the bears performed a positive breakaway and initiated a climb. The lightning now accelerated through Mach 1 towards Mach 2 and beyond. Soon, they were far behind me. Now, as we bring today's video to an end, how should we, as contemporary aviation enthusiasts, remember the lightning? How should it reside in our collective memory? Was it a groundbreaking marvel, a bold testament to the audacity of human ingenuity, continually pushing the frontiers of aviation technology? Was it a competent yet flawed machine, shining brightly in spite of, or perhaps because of its imperfections? Was it a symbol of nationalism, a point in pride for rosy-eyed Brits to look back on and remember a time when the nation was more powerful in the world? Or was it just simply a really cool, really quick airplane? In many ways, the Lightning was all of those things. It meant different things to different people, and thus can be interpreted through many lenses, each as valid as the next. History is, after all, completely subjective. The beauty of the Lightning, as with all things, truly lies in the eye of the beholder. There isn't a definitive right or wrong way to understand it. So, as we conclude today's video, let's open it to you. What are your thoughts, your impressions, your stories related to the Lightning? We'd love you to let us know in the comments below. And thanks for watching.